Good evening, Castle Baptist, and for those who are joining us further afield, good evening to you as well. We are great and pleased that you are joining with us, and we thank you for joining our uh, service this evening. We're going to be dealing with a rather difficult passage. Uh, it's somewhat of a controversial passage today. I suspect uh, if you go back in history, it wasn't as controversial, but today, because of the subject matter that it deals with, uh, it is a little controversial, but hopefully we'll be able to get through it and we will have an understanding of it. If you would join with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we are going to be reading from verse 2, and we're going to read through to verse 16. So if you've got your Bible with you, can I encourage you to open it up, keep it open as we read through God's Word and as God's Word is preached to us. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the teachings just as I pass them on to you. Now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is just as though her head were shaved. If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut or shaved off, she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. For this reason, and because of the angels, the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head. In the Lord, however... Woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair... It is a disgrace to him. But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come to a very, very important passage today, and as we wrestle through this passage, we really do pray that you would give us understanding and insight. We acknowledge that our understanding is dependent upon the spiritual light that you give, and as we work our way through this passage, we pray that your spirit would enable us to understand what you have written, why you have written and how what you have written is applicable to us. We pray, Lord, that you would give us an openness and that you would help us to not simply understand your word, but to work out how we can apply this into our own situation. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Scott Nugent was born a female 48 years ago. Today, Scott has gone, undergone radical, invasive, and destructive tr transition treatments. And so he writes as follows. I'm a 48-year-old transgender man. I was thrilled when the medical community told me six years ago that I could change from a woman to a man. I was informed about all the wonderful things that would happen due to medical transition, but all the negatives were glossed over. Since then, I've suffered tremendously, including seven surgeries, pulmonary embolism, 
an induced stress heart attack, sepsis, a 17-month recurring infection, 16 rounds of antibiotics, three weeks of daily IV antibiotics, arm reconstructive surgery, lung, heart, and bladder damage, insomnia, hallucinations, PTSD, $1 million in medical expenses, and loss of home, car, career, and marriage. All this, and yet I cannot sue the surgeon responsible, in part because there is no structured, tested, or widely accepted baseline for transgender health care. Now, that was written a number of years ago, and I don't know what the updated situation is with this particular person. But the reality is that we are living in a world where roles have been reversed, and the way in which we function means the lines between men and women have been blurred. And because those lines have been blurred and sometimes crossed, we are living in a world where if you say anything against those kinds of things, you are silenced or you are cancelled or you are shut down, you are vilified and you are not allowed to voice your opinion. And part of the reason of this is because the identity of people is bound up as far as they are concerned with what they declare themselves to be. And so if you question whether or not a person is a man or a woman, if they've declared themselves to be such, even though genetically or biologically they may be something different, you are not allowed to question that because their identity is bound up with their own declaration of what they are. And so when we turn to this particular scripture in God's word, God is very clear in terms of creation. God is very clear in terms of the roles of men and women. God is very clear about the distinctiveness between the two sexes. And Paul deals with how this fleshes itself out in the Corinthian society. And, and thus, as he deals with this in modern day, he touches on a number of areas that at times are, are somewhat uncomfortable for us, but are necessary for us to wrestle through, because at the end of the day, it's not about what society tells us, it's about what God tells us, and it's about what God has designed us to be. And so since God has created us as human beings and God has defined the parameters in which we operate, it seems to me that it's important for us to glean what God says as to how we need to function as male and female and how we need to function in the broader sense of the society in which we live. And as Paul writes through this Corinthian church, the interesting thing for me when I read this particular passage is Paul deals with a situation that is not dissimilar to the situations we face today. If you look into the history of Corinth, you will discover that they were grappling with some of the problems that we grapple with today. For example, the feminist movement was present even back then, and there were women who were rebelling against the fact that they were women. They were cutting their hair short, which was, in that society, a disgrace. They were uncovering their heads, which, in the Corinthian society, was also a disgrace. They were casting off the roles that God had given them, and they were seeking to take on the roles of men. In other words, they were seeking to become like men. And so as Paul writes this letter to the Corinthians, sadly what has occurred in the Corinthian situation is this feminism has come into the church and is now affecting the church so that some of the Corinthian Christians are operating in the same way that the world is operating. And Paul has to hit this nail on the head before it gets out of hand. And the reason he has to do that is because the Christian community is fundamentally different to the world. 
God has transformed them. God has created them into a new creation. God has changed them. And God puts them as a light into the world into which they are. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're in the Roman world as the people to whom Paul is writing are in. It doesn't matter whether you're in our world today. The fact is, those same uh, principles that applied back then apply today, and the church is the same today as it was back then. It is meant to be a light in our community, and we of all people need to be demonstrating and showing what the values of God are. Now, some people have tried to write off this passage of Scripture, and the reason they've tried to write it off is because it goes against modern sensibilities. So the way in which they've done that is they've sought to label Paul a misogynist. They simply accuse him of being guilty of misogyny or being a chauvinist, and they say that, in fact, when Paul writes in this letter to the Corinthians, he's no longer writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. He's simply offering his own opinion, and since it is Paul's own opinion, we can simply dismiss it as irrelevant because it's Paul's opinion and it's not God's word. Of course, the moment you go down that road, then it simply becomes a matter of who chooses what's opinion and what's not opinion. And when you play fast and loose with the Word of God, and you begin to make subjective choices about what you consider to be inspired and what you consider not to be inspired, you can simply turn God's Word into something that suits your particular opinions, and anything that contradicts your opinions, you can simply write off as an opinion of the writer who is writing God. God's word. And this is nothing new. After all, is not the very first deception that comes along when Satan addresses Adam and Eve in the garden where there is no sin and they're living in a perfect world is the first, not the first deception, did God say? And so what we are dealing with today is nothing different that has been around for thousands of years. God's word is questioned and God's authority is questioned. As soon as that word and authority happens to contradict what you and I think should be the norm. Others have accused Paul of simply writing in a cultural context. And so the way in which they write off this passage is they simply say, well, you see what's going on here is Paul is writing into a particular contextual situation and that contextual situation is only applicable for that that particular context. Now, the moment you go down that road, then you have to deal with the problem of when Paul raises the issue here of God and Christ. Is that only applicable to the Corinthian situation? Is God only the head of Christ for the Corinthians, or has God been the head of Christ for all eternity and will continue to be so for all eternity? Does that relationship only confine itself? You see, the moment you begin to question whether or not Paul is writing under the inspiration of God's Spirit, if you're going to throw out one part, you've got to throw it all out. And if you're going to throw it all out, you have to throw out the verse that simply says to us that uh, God uh, is the head or the head of Christ is God. And so, again, we begin to play fast and loose with the Word of God. And Paul, besides uh, it being a contextual situation, you will notice as we go through the passage, actually goes right back to creation. And so he takes us back to the point at which you and I simply can't reduce it to the context of the Corinthian situation. It's impossible. And so it's important for us to realize that when Paul writes this letter, he's writing to a situation where there was already a form of rebellion occurring amongst the women, not only in the Corinthian context, but even more broadly in Rome, that were throwing off the restraints of what it meant to be a woman and were asserting their right to declare themselves to be able to start functioning in the same way as a man, contrary to the roles that God has assigned to them, and that these roles that God gives us go right back to creation. 
Now these roles don't change as a result of the four uh, um, uh, coming in because when we hear how God has set up society in, uh, to function, he sets it up to function before the four occurs. The four interrupts that, the four makes it worse, and the four highlights now, the, the fact that sin makes this problem even greater uh, in terms of the way in which men and women function today. Of course, when Adam and Eve were first created, there wasn't a problem in the functioning. They functioned in exactly the way that God created them. After sin entered into the situation, now we have this battle of the sexes that has been occurring ever since the fall. And as God writes as a result or the consequence of the fall, and he says to a woman, men, uh, you shall desire your husband, but he will rule over you. And so we have, right from the word go, this ongoing battle. It is nothing new. So what we experience in the world in which we live today, though we think that we sometimes experience unique things, what God's word demonstrates to us is, in the words of Ecclesiastes, there is nothing new under the sun. What has gone before uh, is happening today. And though the evidence or the, the particular manifestation of that may be in slightly different ways, the, the underlying principle of what's going on has always been around. So having tried to set something of the scene, I want to get to the text now, and we're going to take this slowly. Firstly, I want you to notice the principle of authority is established. Paul sta establishes the principle of authority right at the word go. So verse 3, if you take verse 3, the rest of the verses that follow verse 3 are basically a working out of the principle of verse 3. And Paul works it out in a number of different ways. But verse 3 is your foundational verse that sets up the rest of the verses. But I want to take a step back and just look at verse 2. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the teachings just as I passed them on to you. Now, I think the NRV has translated that quite well uh, when it has translated the teachings because I think that is, in fact, what that word in the original language means. It's referring to teachings. Now, what on earth is Paul saying there? When you think about this Corinthian letter, Paul has been addressing all kinds of problems, has he not? There have been problems of a, a, a son sleeping with his stepmother. There have been problems of eating, problems of idolatry. There have been problems of discrimination, all these kinds of problems. And now Paul says, I praise you for remembering me in everything. Well, at least he begins by saying, at least you have written to me. At least you have consulted me. At least you have sent a letter with a, a whole lot of questions. And as we have been moving through Corinthians, we see uh, Paul beginning to address those different questions. So Paul begins at least by saying to them, I praise you that you have at least remembered to ask me about those things that you are unsure of. But what about the next part? And for holding to the teachings, just as I pass on to the, you. Well, the reality is that even though Paul has been addressing some of these practical issues, a man uh, sleeping uh, with his stepmother, uh, food uh, and idols and idolatry and those kinds of things, one of the things that Paul hasn't had to deal with is some of the really big stuff. He hasn't had to deal with the doctrine of the Trinity, for example. He hasn't had to wrestle with them about that. They don't have any issues with that particular doctrine. And neither has he had to deal with in any depth the whole doctrine of salvation. Yes, they've been saying, I follow Paul, I follow Cephas, and Paul has dealt with that. But in terms of the, the fundamental doctrine, he hasn't had to deal with that. He hasn't had to deal with a number of really foundational doctrines. Because in some sense, the Corinthians have got some teachings right. Right. 
And so Paul wants to say to them, you haven't, it's not that everything you've got here is a mess. Some of the teaching that uh, has been passed down to you, some of the teaching that I've given to you already has been good and has been right, and I don't need to correct you on that. And some of your fundamentals are right, and I don't need to correct you on that, which is why he commends them. Now, he also does it because he's about to address something very, very important. And it's a means of kind of softening the blow, if I can put it like you. It's a little bit perhaps like when a doctor comes to you and says, I've got good news and I've got bad news. And they give you the good news first to kind of soften the blow of what's coming next. So they may say to you, uh, the good news is, is that uh, whatever disease you've got is treatable. We are able to help you in that disease. And then the bad news is, well, it's actually cancer that you've got, but, but we are able to treat it. And so that, that good news kind of softens the blow. And that's also why Paul begins by saying, I commend you. Now we go to verse 3. Now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every Woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, one of the issues we need to deal with right at the start of this is to try and discover what the meaning of head is. And there have been basically two ways in which this word has been interpreted. And this, one of the ways has been a more modern way of, interpret, of interpreting this particular word. The two possible ways of, of interpreting it, kephale, is either source or authority. And uh, some have uh, translated uh, source. And they've tried to say, well, uh, to, to soften the blow here, we read it like this. That now I want you to realize that the source of every man is Christ and the source of woman is man. And so they say this is not dealing with authority. This is just dealing with where these things come from. That men come from Christ, men come from women, and, and so Christ is the source, woman is the source of men. And, and so it's not dealing with authority. Now, the moment you go down that route, you have all kinds of problems. Because if you're going to be consistent, then you have to say, God is the source of Christ. And if God is the source of Christ, that makes a mockery of the deity of Christ. If Christ has been derived from God, come from God, come out of God, then Christ no longer exists in and of himself. And if, if God is the source of Christ, then it destroys the Trinity. And so if you're going to argue along those lines for the sake of consistency, you must then write off uh, God, uh, uh, Jesus' deity. And if that is the case, if Jesus simply comes from God and God is the source of Christ, you destroy redemption. There's no possibility for us being saved. You destroy the Trinity and you destroy ultimately the family. In fact, when you look at this word and you look at the way in which the word is used, I want to give you very briefly, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. You can do their own work. We just don't have the time. I want to give you five quick reasons why this word is better translated authority. In fact, it's the only way it can be translated that gives you any sense of coherency and fits within the broader context, not only of this passage, but in the broader broader context of the New Testament and the broader context of uh, the whole of the Bible. Number one, when this word is used in many other passages, it is nearly always translated authority. It nearly always means authority. That is the way that it is consistently used in other passages. Number two, the word used in the Septuagint is never, ever used in the sense of source. Now, I want to just pause here for a moment to explain what is meant by that. 
For those of you who uh, have done a bit of reading, you will know that the Septuagint is the Greek version of the Old Testament. Now, the Apostle Paul drew heavily from the Septuagint uh, uh, in his learning um, and in his writings. And so when you go to the Greek version of the Old Testament and you trawl through that, you will discover when this word is used, this Greek word is used, it is never used of source. It is only used to designate authority. And so there is a, a tremendous body of evidence there arguing that this word should be translated authority. Number three. When we look at the way in which Paul uses this word elsewhere in Scripture, elsewhere in the New Testament, he uses it in the sense of authority. I've just pulled out two, just to give you an idea. So if we go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head of over everything for the church. Here, he is the authority over everything for the church. He is the one to whom we submit. All things are pointed under his, his feet. There is an obvious relationship here that's been spoken of as Christ being the authority and the church being in submission to him. Colossians 2 verse 10. And you have been given the fullness of Christ, who is the head over every power and every authority. So in other words, here it's talking about the fact that Christ rules. Christ is the authority over all power and all authority. It is a universal statement. So it's quite clear that Paul uses this. There are others, but we don't have time to go through all of them. Number four, if the word translated as source, uh, then the other parallel in verse three makes no sense, and I've dealt with that already. In other words, if God is the source of Christ, then that parallel falls down completely. Number five, if source is the correct translation, then it is clearly not found either in the Septuagint, in the New Testament, in Paul, or anywhere else in Scripture. So the vast body of evidence we have seems to argue against that. So that's the primary issue that is at stake here, is Paul is dealing with the, how the relationships occur, firstly between uh, men and Christ, then between men and women, then between Christ and God. And it's interesting, and we'll get there, so just hang in there. It's interesting that the last relationship he deals with is the one between Christ and God. And he does that with good reason. So let's take a look at this. First, Christ is the head of every man. So let's look at it. Now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ. Now, when he speaks about every man, he's speaking universally here. He's not just speaking about uh, a, a few men. He's not just speaking about the church. He's speaking about everyone. Christ is the head of everyone. Now, of course, that immediately raises a question in your mind, I'm sure, when you say, but what about those who are not Christians? What about those who are in rebellion to God? Well, simply because they are in rebellion against God and simply because they haven't submitted to Christ does not mean that Christ is still not head over them, that Christ still has authority over all of the creation. For example, we are told in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, Then Jesus came and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, says Jesus. God has placed Christ over all creation so that all people come under his authority, whether they acknowledge him or not. 
Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8. And put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. So here is uh, everyone who is placed under the authority of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are told in Philippians that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Paul is simply reinforcing a principle that is already present elsewhere in Scripture. Jesus Christ ultimately is authoritative over his entire creation, over all people. No one is, escapes under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, man is head of woman. Now this is where the controversy, more often than not, rears its ugly head. Man is in authority over woman. And this we want to work out. Now, when Paul talks about this authority, I'm, I don't think he's confining it simply to the church, neither is he confining it simply to husbands and wives. Rather, Paul is looking at this in the broadest possible sense. In other words, in how God has created his creation, how he has made us to function, and Paul is then going to give us examples and work that out in the rest of the passage. We are meant to function in a way that men have authority and women are to operate in a way that indicates their submissiveness to men because that's how God has created it. Now, please don't misunderstand what's being said here. Obviously, we are not talking about where that authority is abused and where, unfortunately, over the years, and there have been many instances of this, where men have abused their authority and where they have created all kinds of uh, problems for women who have been subject to the way in which they have carried out the abuse. Scripture does not condone that in any sense. Any man who exercises his authority over a woman in a way that abuses her, whether that be mentally, psychologically, emotionally, or physically, is anti-God, is anti-Scripture, and there is no place for it whatsoever in the people of God and in the society in which God has created. And I want to be absolutely clear about that. There is no reason for any man to take this passage and to use it as a means by which he can abuse any woman under any circumstances. Now, understanding that that is, is true and that God has not caused this relationship to occur so that abuse can be perpetrated by those who have it. What we need to understand, nevertheless, is that God has placed men in authority, and that is the way that God has created us to function. And I know that this flies in the face of the world in which we live today. And I know that sometimes what happens when we speak about the authority that God has given to man, and Paul's going to deal with this because he says God created men first and his glory is seen in the fact that he created man and the glory of man is seen in the fact that woman was created out of man. There is a different method that God chose to use right back at the beginning, in the way in which he ordered society. And so he creates man, he gives man the responsibility of, uh, the divine responsibility of ruling over the earth. He has been given authority to rule over the earth. Woman is created as someone who enables and helps man. She is his helper created to fulfill the role that God has given him to rule over the earth. 
And so that those lines of authority, and we're going to come back to that, are established right at creation. But I want you to see here that Paul is very clear about the relationships between men and women. Now, we need to, again, just speak a little bit more about this because I think sometimes it can be misunderstood. What Paul is not saying is that there is a difference in equality between men and women. Unfortunately, this passage by feminists has sometimes been distorted to say that, that Paul is a chauvinist and he's saying that somehow men are superior to women and women are inferior to, to men because they have authority over women. Paul is not saying that. That is to distort and to twist the words of the Apostle Paul. There is no sense in which men in any way are superior to women intellectually, emotionally, uh, uh, psychologically, in the way in which we function. There are uh, some women who are much, much brighter than many men, and uh, there's no way in which Paul is dealing with this issue of equality in terms of personhood, in terms of who we are. If I can quote from uh, the, uh, not the Apostle Paul, if I can quote from John MacArthur. A church may have some women who are better Bible students, better theologians, better speakers than any of the men, including the pastor, and that is true. But if those women are obedient to God's order, they will submit to male leadership and will not try and usurp it, simply because that is God's design. A wife may be better educated, better taught in Scripture, more spiritually mature than her husband. But because she is spiritual, she will willingly submit to him as the head of the family. The proper relationship specifically designed as described in Ephesians. And then I want to quote another one from John MacArthur. But he makes no distinction between men and women as far as personal worth, abilities, intellect, or spirituality are concerned. Hear this. Both as humans and as Christians, women in their general in general are completely equal to men spiritually i want you to hear that some women obviously are even superior to some men in abilities intellect maturity and spirituality god established the principle of male authority and female subordination for the purpose of order and complementarian not on the basis of any innate superiority of males. An employee may be more intelligent and more skilled than his boss, but a company cannot be run without submission to proper authority, even if some of those in authority are not as capable as they ought to be. Elders and deacons are to be chosen from amongst the most spiritual of the congregation, but there may be other men in the church who are even more spiritual. Yet, for, every, for the very reason that they are spiritual, those not in positions of leadership will submit to those who are. So the issue that Paul is raising has got nothing to do with the worth of a person. This is not about my standing before God. The level of... Uh, or the, rather, the ground at the cross is absolutely level. And this is not about one being better than the other. What the Apostle Paul is addressing here is the God-assigned roles that he has given to men and women in order for society to function the way that God intended 
and created it to function. And this goes right back to the fall. When God first created Adam and gave Adam the responsibility of ruling over creation. And as God looked down on that creation, what did he observe? In the words of scripture, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will create a helper for him. And so as a result of that situation of not good, God creates a helper for Adam, one who comes alongside him, one who comes out of his side, who is equal with him, one who fulfills a different function to the, uh, 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 Adam, and one that is meant to function in complementary uh, fashion to Adam. And it's really important for us to understand that. This is how God has designed society to work. And when we rebel against God's design, what happens is we break down society and we introduce chaos and we introduce our own set of problems as a result of that. When we follow the design of our maker, we find there is peace and harmony and society functions the way that God means it to function. Now, everyone knows this intrinsically. If you buy a car that is a diesel car and you drive that diesel car to a petrol station and you stick petrol in instead of diesel, you're going to create all kinds of problems for that car. In fact, it may end up in some significant damage because that car is designed to run on diesel, not on petrol. Now, I know of people who have got this wrong and have done incredible damage to their engines. Thank goodness nowadays, the size of the nozzle you put in is different, so it's impossible to make that kind of mistake uh, in a car because of the size of the nozzle, or certainly in one of them. Now, in the same way, we are designed in terms of how we are functioned for a man to be in authority and a woman to learn how to submit to that authority in a way that is supportive, in a way that is enthusiastic, because that is how society is designed to function. And when Paul speaks about this, he doesn't just speak about it in a, in a small sense, he speaks about it in a broad sense, in all relationships in our society are meant to function in this way. Unfortunately, we have distorted it. We have allowed ourselves to buy into the lie that Satan has brought and it has crept even within the church that uh, the roles are no different, that the roles are exactly the same and therefore women have been given positions in many different churches, not this particular church, but in many different churches that God does not permit them to exercise within the bounds of Scripture. And Paul is going to deal with this in chapter 14. We're going to come to chapter 14 where Paul deals with it even more decisively than what he deals with it here. There he's going to say, uh, uh, talk about how women function within church and how God has designed them to function. He's already dealt with this in 1 Timothy. We've dealt with that previously in a morning service. You can look up the sermon where Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have an authority over a man. Now that one is specifically confined to the church context where preaching and teaching occurs and where leadership occurs. But that same principle here in Corinthians is now broadened to work out in the broader parts of society where men are meant to lead, where men are meant to take on that role of authority, that role of leadership. And what has happened in society, and you know it's true as much as I know it's true, is that when men relinquish that role, when men do not take on the roles that God has given them, when they compromise their masculinity, that masculinity that God has given them, and not in a distorted way, in a 
good way, in a biblical way, when they hand that over, women will take on those responsibility precisely because men have uh, given it over to them. And Paul is wanting to correct this error in the Corinthian situation and in that church and broad, more broadly speaking in the Corinthian society and more broadly speaking in the Roman society. That men are meant to lead. They are meant to be in positions of authority. God has assigned them that particular role. It is the way in which they are created to function. And women are created to follow. Women are created to submit. That's how God has designed them. And if the relationship between men and women are going to function in harmony, are going to function in peace, are going to function in a way that is going to benefit our society, benefit our world, and build a healthy society, society, then they will take these principles and they will work them out in their application in our society. Sadly, we have done something different. We have sought to rebel against God. We have sought to take control of our own ideas of how this should function. And we have sought to distort these roles. And we have sought to change them. And we have sought to make them something into which God has not created them to be. Second. Uh, sorry, third. God is the head of of Christ. God is the head of Christ. Look at that in verse 4. I'm not putting words into Paul's mouth. And the head of Christ is God. Now God, in terms of how the Trinity functions, functions in a way that each person of the Trinity has a slightly different way in which they operate. That does not mean that the roles in which they operate somehow diminish their equality. So what I want to make clear right at the very start is that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are absolutely equal. There is no difference in their intrinsic being, in their nature in who they are, in their equality. There is no difference between them. They are co-equal. And I want you to hear those words very clearly because it's very easy to misunderstand what's going on here. But what happens in terms of the way in which they function, the roles in which they perform, they perform different roles. And one of the things that Christ the Son does is he submits to God the Father. For I've not come down to do my own will, says Jesus, but to do the will of him who sent me. In other words, Jesus is submitting to the will of God the Father. And it is only through the submission and obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ Christ, that we have a Savior that goes to the cross. And Jesus goes to the cross precisely because he understands how he is meant to function in relationship to that uh, uh, God the Father. And he submits willingly. He submits voluntarily. He does not submit because he is forced or coerced or because God is twisting his arm or because God is just being a capricious kind of a, a father who, who says, you do this and you just do it because I said so, but right Rather, Jesus Christ lovingly and willingly and wants to submit to God the Father. That is how he functions. Now, the same is true in terms of how the Spirit functions. The Spirit functions differently to the Son. So when you take it, for example, in salvation, what we discover is God the Father elects a people for himself. Christ the Savior secures their salvation through his death on the cross. God the Holy Spirit then applies that salvation and gives faith to those who will believe. So that each member of the Trinity, though they are equal in relationship with each other, are functioning in a slightly different way. It's not a hierarchical thing. It's not a superiority, inferiority thing. It is simply a means by which they function. So, for example, I want to read some scripture uh, just to make this clear. 
Jesus says in John 4, 34, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. In chapter 5, verse 30, By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. And then in John 10, verse 10b, God Uh, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. So in the same way that men and women function and Christ functions in terms of all creation, he also functions in relationship to God. And so since he submits to God the Father, because God is the authority and he submits willingly to him, if we are going to say that it is true of Christ, and it is, we must then also say it is true of the other two relationships that Paul brings out in this particular verse. Then when you read it in 1 Corinthians 15, 28, when he has done this all, when he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. In other words, all of these three relationships that Paul highlights work as a whole. You can't separate one out and simply assign to it a meaning that is not in the text because you don't like what it says. And it doesn't matter that you might not like what it says. The fact is, it is God's word. And so if you accept one, you accept all three. And if uh, it is true of uh, God, uh, Jesus submitting to God the Father, then it is true that women submit to man and God has given him that role of authority. Therefore, let me try and make some application. We will finish the sermon next week. I don't have time to finish it tonight, and I really want to get, because we've got some really interesting subjects. We've got a subject of long hair, for example. Should a man wear long hair or not? You'll have to come back next week to get an answer to that. Should women wear hats in church? You'll have to come back next week to get an answer for that. We'll finish it next week. But what I want to just say by way of application that when we think about these relationships, particularly as we think about it within the church, we have to realize that God has given the role of leadership, the role of authority to men. And men, if they are going to function because they are accountable to God at the end of the day, they will answer to God, need to take that role and take the bull by the horns and they need to lead. They need to accept that role from God. They must not farm it out to women. They must not simply relinquish it. They must not simply submit to it because it's too hard in our world today. The world is going to fight you at every point. It is. That's the world we live in. They're going to shout at you and they're going to say to you, you're a chauvinist or you're a misogynist and they're going to try and put all kinds of labels on you when you function like that. And they're going to try and shout you down and they're going to try to embarrass you in front of others. They're going to do all those things because it goes against what they believe in their hearts. And what you need to do, you need to stand firm and you need to say, it doesn't matter what the world is screaming in my ear, my responsibility is before God. One day, men, you will stand before God and God will call you to account. And God will call you to account as to how you have exercised the authority that has been delegated to you by God. You will stand and you will answer for that. And if you have not accepted that responsibility, if you have not led your family, if you have not led your wife, if you have not led within the church, if you have not been one who has taken on that role, then God will hold you to account. And woman, can I say to you, your role is different. It's not inferior. It's just different. And the different role that God has given you is to follow, is to follow the leadership, is to submit to the authority of man. 
And I know that there is in you a wanting to rebel against that. That comes from the fall. Is not that what Adam uh, happened to Eve as a curse? Your desire will be for your husband. And the desire there is to rule over him. Your desire is to want to usurp that authority. That unfortunately is one of the consequences of the curse. It is going to be with humanity until Christ comes again. And so there is that sense in which you are going to want to fight against his authority you are going to want to rebel against it but if you are a Christian you have been transformed by Christ you have been changed by Jesus you are a new creation you have been given power that you never had before you came to Christ and God will give you the strength to learn what it means to follow in submission to your husband to follow in submission to male leadership within the church and within society because you are in Christ. And so this becomes part and parcel of who you are. Your identity is not bound up in your submission to your husband or your submission to male leadership or male authority. That's not where you derive your identity from. Your identity is derived from your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and it must be grounded in that and only grounded in that. And Christ died for you. Christ gave his life for you. Christ has put in a, an, in a, a value upon you that is inestimable. You cannot put a value on that. And so derive your being, your essence, your identity from who you are in Christ. And what is true of you, woman, is true of you, men. Your identity is not in your authority. It's not in your role of leadership. That's just the role that God has given you, and it's under his authority. But your identity as to who you are is in Christ, and that identity should drive all your actions. So can I encourage you? You may need to go away and do some... Uh, praying. You may need to go away and do some repenting. You may need to go away and as you sit down on your knees and say, Lord, I haven't been doing this. I haven't been operating like this. I've been fighting against this. Lord, I need to repent. Lord, I need to submit. And I'm going to do it for your sake, Jesus. Because that's the role that you have given me. That's how you've designed me to function. And when I function like that, I find my greatest fulfillment because I begin to function according to my design. So can I encourage you to do that? It's going to be hard. For some of you, it's going to be very difficult because year for years, you've been operating differently. It's going to be painful. But in the end, the reward will outweigh the pain you experience. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. It, has such a word for us in our world today. And we pray that you would give us the courage to embrace it, the courage to be able to submit to it, the courage to enthusiastically follow what you have said. Lord, we know that you don't give these things in an arbitrary way, but you have designed us for a particular purpose, you have designed us for particular roles, and we pray that you would give us the courage to fulfill those roles as we submit ultimately to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in all things. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. God bless you and I trust that you will have a great week that lies ahead.